All right. So um, yes, um, in addition to the the giveaways, a uh, copy of my book is in the library. So if you, if you weren't one of the lucky winners of the hard copy, you can definitely get it and check it out from the library itself. All right. So right off the bat, even though we call this presentation is technical writing right for me, a broader term is technical communication because communicating can include video, illustrations, it's not just writing. So I wanted to say that right up front. Um, I've already been introduced, so we can skip this slide. What we're gonna talk about this morning is what is technical communication, samples of TechCom, what are the core competencies you would need to be a tech writer? Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit about how to plan a documentation project so you get a feeling for what's involved and then plenty of time for questions and answers. And we also um, gonna look at a few statistics on technical writing and salary surveys. They're kind of hard to read, but you will get a, a copy of the slides after the presentation if you want to um, drill down afterwards. All right. Finally, this is not me talking at you for 45 minutes to an hour. This is group participation. So as we go through the program, if you have any questions, put them in the chat window. I'll either get them as we go through the presentation or try to catch them at the end. And then finally, a disclaimer. I've heard it said that in some cultures, artists think to attempt perfection is to anger the gods. So they purposely leave, leave a little imperfection in any art they create. If you find any typos in here today, just not angering the gods. All right, let's go on. So what is technical communication? The Society for Technical Communication, STC, defines technical communication as any form of communication that exhibits one or more of the following characteristics. One, communicating about technical or specialized topics, such as computer software, medical procedures, et cetera. Communicating by using technology, such as building a web page or an online help file, social media sites. And finally, providing instructions on how to do something, regardless of how technical that task is. All right, let's take each one of these. Communicating about a technical or specialized topic, that covers everything from computer hardware and software, aerospace, robotics, finance, medical, chemistry, biotech, right? Even forestry, that's a specialized topic. So what's interesting as we go through these slides, there is the art of technical writing or technical communication. And there's also the industry about which you are writing or communicating. I'll use those words interchangeably throughout the presentation. So, What's interesting is people ask me all the time, should I get a degree in computer technical writing? Not really, you can take a certificate program, but if you're gonna take a, a degree, try to study what you're gonna be writing about, right? So if you have a background in biology, that'll allow you to get a technical writing biology job. If you have a certificate in network administration, you can document how to do network administration. So you've got the task of technical writing and the subject about which you are writing that you need to know about. In this case, some specialized field. Second, we talked about communicating by using technology, right? There are special tools that a tech writer would use to create an online help page or a web page or the little pop-ups that show up in software, right? So again, though, we're talking about communication, not just writing. So a YouTube video um, would be an example of technical communication if it explained how to do something. And then finally, instructions about anything is technical communication. This covers everything from nursery school policies and procedures to how to fix a nuclear submarine. That's a really wide field. Um, another thing you'll find is that there are many titles for technical communicators. Tech writer, technical communicator, I've seen information engineer as a fancy fancy topic uh, title. So when you are looking for jobs, um, do look for writer, but be aware you're gonna have multiple um, titles that will come up when you do your job search. 
All right, so let's look at some examples. The most classic example would be a tech writer, and I'm going to hit escape here and switch screens for a second. All right, so this would be an example of a user manual. If you buy a printer and you get a thing showing you how to put it together, that's technical writing, right? There tends to be two types of technical writing. One is conceptual information. That's information about something. For example, in this sample, the first paragraph is, what is a print driver? It's explaining something. But the second is a procedure. It tells you how to do something. And every type of technical writing in the world or technical communication is either conceptual or procedural, okay? All right, here's another example. If we looked up, how do you fix a flat tire on YouTube? Someone created this video. It explains how to do something. So it would be technical communication as well, okay? So you've got your traditional tech writing, printed user manual, video, illustrations, um, posters. There's many, many different forms that technical writing can take. All right, let's go back to my slides. Okay. So what kind of skills do you need to be a tech writer? One, one would think good communication skills, both written and verbal, but critical thinking. For example, if you're using software and the instruction is enter a number between one and nine, what happens if you press the letter A? Will it blow up? Will it just give you an error message saying, no, we need a number here. It's up to you to, when you're explaining something to a reader or a viewer or user that, well, this is what it should do, but what happens if something goes wrong? So it's your job to figure these things out. And a lot of times you're documenting something that doesn't even exist yet, right? So you need those critical thinking skills. Next, if more often than not, you are documenting something that someone else created, whether that's medical software, a medical device, a procedure for installing a printer. So whoever built that item, you're probably gonna to have to interview them, go, what does it do? What does it not do? Um, what, um, what are the cautions? Have you ever seen one of those user manuals that says, do not use this in a bathtub? So clearly somebody tried using one of these in a bathtub at one time. So it's really important that you find out what's important from the person who created it so you could then document, okay? Conflict resolution, who would have thought? There are often multiple subject matter experts. And what do you do if one person says, oh, it should be orange, and the other one says, no, it should be red, and you're the technical writer stuck in the middle. So part of this is getting them in the same room or on the same Zoom call and said, okay, I can document this either way, but you guys deem decide which way it should go. Project management. Um, you all, almost always have a deadline against which you are writing or working against. It's up to you to manage your time. It's also quite common for you to be working on multiple projects at a time. So project management is a big part of technical writing. Persistence. Remember those subject matter experts I mentioned? Oftentimes you say, I need the comments by Monday and Monday comes and goes and no comments. So it's up to you to stay after those people on from whom you need information, okay? Curiosity, what does this thing do? What does it not do? What will happen if somebody types in something wrong, right? If you're using a program say on how to draw a square, that's not really, a problem if you draw it too big or too small. What if it's medical software and you forget to, the, the user forgets to write in that someone has a, an allergy to um, a particular drug and that patient gets the drug, that patient could die. It's that serious, right? So part of our job is to say, what can go wrong? What do we do about it and how do we prevent it? And that's all out of curiosity is you asking the right questions, which leads me to the next bullet is a quick learner. We often don't have time to spend days and days and days learning something. You got to get in it, get it done, go on to the next project. So quick learner is another attribute that makes for a good tech writer. 
And again, finally, able to handle changing requirements and priorities. Um, it is very often someone goes, oh, wait, we need to ship this, drop what you're doing, work on this. And you go, okay, you know, and you're juggling multiple priorities, multiple projects, what do I have to get done today? Oh, they just made a new change, I gotta get that done. So this is not a good field if you want very slow and steady. Tech writing is not just writing, it's all these other things we're talking about on the screen. So you need to be a very good communicator, not just a good writer. All right. Let me see um, the chat window before we go on to the next question uh, or section on my slides. What is my opinion of Grammarly software? Any grammar software package, um, there's a couple of things that you can consider. There's grammar checkers, there's spell checkers, but they don't always catch all the mistakes you might make. For instance, um, take a word that sounds similar. Um, bat can make mean hit something. It can also mean a mammal, a flying mammal. So oftentimes the grammar checkers won't check um, really what you need. Most often you have what's called a style guide where, for instance, if you're documenting software, do you want to say click, click on, press? Because what you want to do is be consistent and you don't want a manual may have five or six writers working on it if it's really big you want to have one voice. So yes, grammar checkers are great, but they're not infallible. All right, let's can we go down to the next question here. Can you please touch on writing portfolios? Yeah, let me bring that up at the end. Um, I do a whole, by the way, Angela, I do a whole presentation on how to create a portfolio. So that might be a good follow-on session to this one. All right, let's move on. Types of technical writing jobs. These are the most common, but there's many, many more. Um, software and hardware user guides. Um, when you buy, again, a printer, how do you plug it in? How do you install it? Um, programmer guides. Software is written in the old days, just on a PC or a big computer. Now it's all web-based, right? And software packages can interface with other software packages and somebody has to document that interface. Right? So programmer guides are very popular, especially in the Bay Area. Online help, policies and procedures, tech support websites, medical writing, marketing writing, and then the software that's embedded in the, the words that are embedded in software, somebody has to write that as well. It's usually called UX writing, user experience writing. That's another type of writing. So again, there are many, many types of technical communication. Here are just a few of the more common ones. All right, let's talk about ways to make money. There are three general ways that you can make money as a tech writer. Either you're a salaried employee with benefits like normal salary job. You can be a contractor where you get paid hourly for maybe a week or two weeks or three months, however long the project is. Or you can start your own technical writing company where companies give you a project, you often bid it, sometimes on a fixed bid. And the faster you get it done, the more money you make. And those are the three ways to make money there's others, but these are the most common. Okay. So if we're talking about money and jobs, I did a quick search um, of the number of technical writing jobs posted in the last 14 days within 30 miles of San Francisco. Dice.com had 13 full-time jobs and 26 contract openings. Indeed had 10, three, and ZipRecruiter had 36. All right. But keep in mind, you have to look for multiple ways. Um, if you just put in writer, you can get policy and procedure writer, a technical writer, a UX writer. So use the more generic writer. Um, you'll also get magazine writer jobs, but it's up to you then to, to drill down and look for the types of jobs you're looking for. All right. I'm going to zoom in here because this is a little hard to read. Um, the latest salary survey from the Society for Technical Communication was 2018. Um, the number of technical writing jobs um, was 8,860, down 4% over the previous year, but employment services and temporary jobs were up 3.8% 3, 3 
and architecture and engineering up 6%. So you can read these numbers afterwards if you want to get down into a little more detail. All right, this is also hard to read, so I'm going to squint and look at my screen here. Of the states, um, California is number one with the most technical writing jobs. Um, I also pulled some salary surveys. The average annual wage is 91310 in California. Now, granted, it'd be higher in the Bay Area and lower in some place like, I don't know, Modesto. Um, but this is the average. Um, the 10th percentile, meaning only 10% of the jobs, pay 53000 And at the top, most of them come in at under 140. So somewhere between 53 and 140, that's a huge gap. That's almost a hundred thousand dollar difference, right? But again, it depends on your city and it depends on the field. Now, early in the presentation, I mentioned that if you have specialized domain knowledge, like if you're if your degree is in biochemistry, you can command a higher salary um, than say someone who has a certificate in gardening, right? Off the top of my head. So the more technical your background, the more technical the job you can write about, right? So when choosing a career, um, technical writing is fun, it's interesting, but you also have to choose where you wanna specialize in, right? And again, that's gonna adjust your salary, but you can look at these numbers later. Okay, so I wanna pause here. Any other questions about job hunting, salary surveys, surveys? and where the jobs are available in the Bay Area. I don't see any questions, Jack. Okay, so in this next section, I'm gonna go through it briefly, just like a builder, if you're gonna have a house built for you, you would normally go to an architect who drops the plans. Uh, an engineer would write up a design document before coding, well, so would a tech writer. We call it a document plan or project plan. I would not expect an entry level person to be able to write one of these from scratch. Your manager probably will, but this will show you the types of information that goes into, in this case, it was a user manual programming guide. All right, the very first thing that you should ask is, what is the, what am I documenting, right? What is the purpose? Am I, is this a user manual? Is it a policies and procedures? just define right up front the purpose of the document, but more importantly, the audiences, right? Am I writing this for someone who's got a PhD in microbiology or is it a installation guide for the general public? That, that affects how you write. Scope, um, this manual will cover accounts receivable and accounts payable, but it's not gonna cover um, say general ledger or payroll, all right? Prerequisites. Um, if this is a programming guide, I'm not going to teach you how to use the programming language. I'm going to assume you already know that language. And you just define these right up front. Does the company have an existing style guide that I need to follow? Or do they need me to create one? All right? How are we going to print this manual? Is it going to be in color, black and white? It's going to be online. Um, who are my subject matter experts and technical reviewers? Who's going to review the plan? Right, I'll give you a war story. We were writing a user manual installation guide for a printer, um, one of the big printer companies. And a week before we went to finish, somebody in their New York office said, oh, I wanna review the manual and just wanted to rearrange the whole thing. Had I known that person was gonna be part of the review cycle, I would have given them the outline because it's much easier to change an outline than it is the manual is already written. So you would, as part of tech writing, just find out who's, who's reviewing this manual because so you're gonna wanna get review comments from them if you remember that. Risks and issues. A risk is anything that could impact the project. An issue is just something that needs to be um, resolved. For example, oftentimes software has a code name before it's actually released. That's fine. Um, I just need to know, give me, I need two days in order to update all the, the names before we go live. And finally, the risk management, I call it shark mitigation. You don't want something to come up and bite you in the butt two days before you ship. So if you 
identify all your risks up front, right? Then it helps makes things go smoothly. Notice though, we haven't even started writing yet, but we're still going through all these steps. So you can get the information you need to write. And then this is when you then create an outline, right? Um, one of the war stories I tell, um, I'm going to define some terms. Um, a white paper is normally a document that's printed on plain white paper. It's normally handed out at trade shows and it tells you about your technology. A, a um, data sheet is usually front and back color with all the specifications for that product. Again, it's usually handed out um, at a trade show, but it's much more expensive to print, much color and um, it goes into more detail. So we had a client who said they wanted a white paper on this particular technology. And we wrote the most beautiful white paper in the history of mankind. You would have wept at the beauty of this white paper. We turn it in and he, he was from Japan. So he was not a native English speaker. And he goes, that not white paper. I go, yes, it is. He goes, no, front, back, color. He wanted a data sheet, but he said white paper. So now we prototype, we go, this is a white paper. Is this what you want? This is what the online help will look like. Is this what you want? This is the level of detail of the illustrations we're gonna use. Is this what you want? And get them to sign off on that before you ever start writing. And that keeps you from having to go back and rewrite stuff from scratch. Okay. So that's a little bit of this is a very fast overview of the technical writing process. All right. So we did the doc plan. And then this is how the user manual ended up. Now, what's interesting, remember I said you have to interview your subject matter experts before you can document something? This was a database system. This is, let um, me skip this for a second. Now let's talk about this now. Somebody in the audience asked about um, portfolios. Normally, I'll put examples of what I've written, um, right, like this, but I also put advertisements for the products that I documented. For example, if you look at the digital camera on the right side of this portfolio, not only did I document that, um, it won an award in a publications competition. I also did the documentation for the S600 uh, printer. Um, I did the, the piece on the right was for a conference. Um, we documented FileMaker Mobile, and this is an advertisement for it. So looking at my black and white samples is okay, but this is more interesting, right? they'll remember these more than they'll remember the black and white page. So just, here's another example. Um, not only did I, okay, this is an example on the, on the left of a data sheet, front and back color. But on the right, when that LCD projector was reviewed by PC Magazine, the review said the concise manual made setup easy. You better believe I put this in my portfolio, okay? All right, finally, a before and after sample. This is how that database was explained to me. It, if this was on a dinner napkin, it would have been even better, but literally this was how it's explained to me. This is how I drew it. And this is how it ended up in the manual. So this is a really good example of what it takes to document something that doesn't exist yet. It's explained to you, you take that explanation and either using words like at the top of this page or a diagram in the middle of the page, or sometimes an animation, okay? Question, roughly what percent of your technical writing work has been done in Microsoft Word? Wow, excellent question. Um, I would say probably nine, 75 to 90% of all technical writing is done in Microsoft Word um, because there's just that many companies out there. However, the bigger the manuals get, for example, there are hundreds of millions of documentation pages on, on how to repair a 747 airplane, right? It would be absolutely impossible to keep all that content in Microsoft Word. So we have very specialized tools that tech writers use. Um, Adobe makes one called FrameMaker. Um, if you look at the Bay Area and do your own usability search, look at who's hiring in the Bay Area and what tools they're looking for. 
Most of them will be looking for Word, but a good 20 to 20, 75, yeah, half in the Bay Area, because we're so high tech in the Bay Area that they want additional tools. But that's a good question. OK. Um, yes, someone else has a question. Go ahead and put it in the chat so I can see it. And I'm going to go on until that question comes up. I think Winston has a question, Jack. Um, they asked, uh, for the printer manual reorg war story, did you have to reorganize it, or was that request considered too late? We, we accommodated them. Now, we chart. Um, OK, so let's, that's a good question. And since we have time for Q&A, now it's Q&A time, let me take that up. So if, if I was a salaried employee and my boss asks me to change the manual, by golly, I'm going to change that manual, right? It's different if you're, if you gave someone a fixed bid, say, okay, I will, you know, I can create that manual for $10,000. And one of the reasons we do the document plan that we, that I walked you through is, but we define all the variables. We know how many pages, we, here's an outline that costs that much amount of money. Had they, had I done a fixed bid and they asked for all those changes, I would have done what's called a change order going, okay, this is what you asked for. It's outside of the scope of our agreement. It's going to take this many days and this much time to do the changes. Do you want me to do them? And you get that in writing. Even if we're a salaried employee, we would still do a change request because it's different than what you originally asked for. Now, a lot of times, this is where your negotiating skills come in. If your boss says, I need you to rearrange this whole manual because somebody in New York wants it, I would go, great. I could do that by Monday, but you're not going to get the index done. Do you want me to stop the index and work on this? I'll get the index done two days later, right? Yes, I can do it. I can absolutely do it. But it just says, this is where triage going, yes, I can do it, but something's going to have to give. Or... I'm gonna to have to work 20 hours a day for the next three days. I want some comp time. This is where, remember I said on the core competencies, um, conflict resolution and negotiation skills, that's where that comes in. Yeah. Okay, good. How does technical writing for internet-based companies like Salesforce differ from technical writing for non-digital products like printers? Excellent question. When you're documenting software that resides on the web, oftentimes you as the tech writer will put the instructions right there on the screen. Give you an example. Have you ever used software and it says, enter your birthday or enter your, uh, your birthday, date of birth. And you put in the database, it goes, no, 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 no. I wanted it in year, month, day. Well, if you would have just told me you wanted it in year, month, day format, I would have typed it in instead of giving me an error message. So a lot of the tech writing when you're doing for digital things like Salesforce, you're putting the tech writing right in the same screen where the software is, or it's a pop-up right next to it. Now, for something like a printer, a non-digital product like a printer, you don't know what language or how uh proficient if you're writing in english that person is english may be a second or third language for them so when writing for a printer we tend to use more illustrations and fewer words especially if you're translating um, the documentation into multiple languages um it's actually more expensive to translate a document than to write it in the first place so i think that's the main difference for an online thing like salesforce you're writing the documentation as part of the product where something like a printer, it's a separate manual that gets shipped with the printer. Excellent questions. Please keep them coming. Any idea what percentage of jobs posting are remote only? Right now, almost all of them. Um, and for years, companies would let somebody telecommute one or two days a week. Um, what we found is people are actually more productive working from home because you don't have people interrupting you. Um, um, that hour that I would have spent, you know, on BART getting to work and then another hour getting home, I could have been working those two hours. So I think you're going to see a lot more fully remote positions 
um, post COVID, um, or maybe spend one day of week at the office instead of five. So good questions. I use a Mac. Do I need uh, a different system to do this work? Yes and no. Um, there is Microsoft Word for Mac. Uh, it's just like Word for Windows, not a problem. But if you're documenting, say, a Windows-based application, well, it's got to be, a, you need the program that it will run on, right? If it's a web-based application, then you just need to open it in your browser. But if it's Windows software, you need to run out of Windows, um, Windows, but more often than not, your employer will be giving you the laptop with whatever operating system they want you to use. A third option other than Mac and Windows is like Amazon Web Services, where you're logging into a virtual machine and it doesn't matter what computer you're logging in from, okay? But more than likely, your employer will be giving you um, a company laptop to work from. Do technical writers conduct interviews or do research with consumers as UX UI designers do? How do technical writers make sure people understand the content? Okay, so let me define some terms. UX is user experience and UI is user interface, the people who design the software screens. Um, what's, this is a very, very, good question because it um, varies from company. Some companies don't want the tech writers talking to the customers. They, they want to limit marketing talking with tech writers. The really good companies do, um, do do user research. For example, I personally know that the technical writers at Intuit who make um, QuickBooks and Quicken will actually go to a store and wait for someone to buy that product and with their permission, follow them home and watch them install it and to see where the pain points are. What did they understand? And what questions did they have that wasn't covered in the manual? That's really good user research. So the more, there's also this thing we call A-B testing. It's like going to the optometrist. Is it clear this way or this way? Where we go, all right, here's two ways we've documented this. Which one is clearer? Right. Here's two illustrations. Which one is easier to read? You're definitely, definitely for a very good company. You as a tech writer, tech com person will be doing user research. If you're not consider maybe going to a company that does. The second half of that question, and I need you to scroll up for a second. How do technical writers make sure people understand the content? Yeah, by usability testing and A-B testing. Um, and actually watching them use it. Um, another way that tech writers um, can show their worth is that if I'm in a software company, you know how there's tech support in most companies? I can go to the tech support team and say, what are the questions most people are calling in with? If it's a procedural issue that's not documented well, I can fix that in the documentation. If it's a problem with the program, well, then they have to go back and fix the program. But that's another source of data. A third source is oftentimes these days we put documentation not printed, it's on the web. Um, and if it's a web page, there are metrics you can use as a tech writer to decide if you're being effective or not. It's open to interpretation though, right? So say someone is looking at your user manual instructions online and they're keeping that window open for a long time, that either means one of two things. One, what you're writing is confusing. It's taking a while for them to read it, or it's really good and they're using it as a reference, such as a programming language. So there are times you can tell, like, did they go to the website? Did they bounce out of the page? Could they not find what they were looking for? You can monitor what they're typing in the chat window or what they're Google searching for. Because so often they'll go, they'll just go straight to Google. How do I, you know, reinstall my S600 printer software? It's your job to make them find your user manual, not necessarily some person on a chat window somewhere. Um, there's another term that I'm just going to bring up briefly. It's called crowdsourcing, where it's actually you let the users, so the customers, write the documentation, um, or you have somebody creating an online tech support portal 
and you find out what people those questions and you answer those questions and those questions and answers become part of the documentation right so that's another thing you could do is monitor what questions are people asking that would show that you um can document that as well okay let's go on to the next question what is the time and money investment for training and certification any recommended schools with an online platform um first of all i used to teach technical writing tech writing 101 for cal state fullerton um now all of them have gone remote so there's hundreds of technical writing classes out there. Um, I can't recommend one or the other. I can tell you though, that a technical writing certificate program, you can complete in a matter of weeks. Um, so research, uh, if you want, knowing we may go in-person classroom again, I'm a firm believer that a hybrid format for training is best, not in-person, not online only, but a blend of both. Um, so as far as time and money, if you do one intro to tech writing class, that's enough to get you your first technical writing job, right? Um, but again, remember I said earlier that you have to have domain knowledge. So in addition to that technical writing class, take a class in database administration or take a class in network administration or in biology because if there are two people going for the same entry level job one has a certificate and training in the domain and the other one doesn't the domain one's probably gonna get the job first okay and it's a lot harder to get a degree in medicine than it is to get a certificate in networking so figure out what you're interested in and research how long it would take but um, you do not need to get a degree in technical writing to do technical writing a certificate is fine Okay, next question. Are user guides moving more online versus print? And do tech writers need more ability with HTML and other web-based layout coding um, more than just knowledge of printing? The short answer is yes, they are going online. Now, I'm gonna answer your question in a little bit of roundabout way, but it will answer this question. So, Take a company like Cisco Systems that has, I don't know, 120 products they sell, each of which needs an installation guide, a tech support page, a brochure, maybe a how-to video. Then multiply that by the 26 languages they translated to worldwide, it would be absolutely impossible to keep that content around in Microsoft Word. So some clever person will take all that content and put it to a database so you can spit it out where you want it when you want it, in the language you want it, on the device you want it. Person who does that is a content strategist, right? Um, so as more and more people start using mobile devices to look up how to do things, you can't take an eight and a half by 11 manual and read it on a mobile device. You'd be constantly scrolling up and down, left and right. So there are tools that if you put your documentation on the web, the web browser knows what device you are using to read that page, right? If I'm on a big screen, it might give me four columns of text because I've got that bandwidth, I've got that real estate. If I'm reading it on a laptop, I may get three columns of text. If I'm looking at it on a tablet, I may get two columns. And if I'm looking at it on a phone, I'll get one column. So the documentation is responsive. It knows what you are reading that device, what device you're using to read that manual, and it will format it accordingly. So yes, you need HTML, is hypertext markup language, um, but there are a lot of tools that will do that HTML for you. So your job, um, it's not my slides, but everybody get a pen or watch this afterwards. There's a thing called DITA, spelled D-I-T-A. It stands for Darwin Information Typing Architecture, really fancy schmancy name. It's just a way of putting this stuff in a database. Um, traditionally, if we're using Microsoft Word to write a manual, and you may have done this if you've ever used Word before, where you go, okay, I got my heading, it's gonna be this big and black, and then I have some 
the heading's that big, the paragraph's this big, right? We're formatting the document as we go. That takes a lot of time. Well, that works if you're printing a manual and you know it's gonna be on eight and a half by 11 paper. That doesn't work if you're putting it online and you don't know how, what device a person's reading your document, your documentation using. So things like DITA, and if you go to learningdita.com, you can take a free class on it. Um, DITA is one of these ways where you just type the information in and it's formatted when it's output, not when it's written. So now we're getting into what's called structured authoring. It's in a database. So 90% of the jobs you will encounter are not structured authoring. They're plain old using Word to write a manual. But the fastest growing segment is the structured authoring. So I would, if you're, if you're interested in tech writing, take a class in DITA, like at learningdita.com, because that will also give you yet another tool in your toolbox to make you hireable. Okay, good questions. Nine more, oh my gosh, let's go. All right, any suggestions for companies to, well done, any suggestions for companies to information interviews with, that is both technical writing companies as well as corporations who hire a large number of tech writers? Um, yes, um, there are companies out there, there are staffing companies like mine who specialize in tech writing. Um, there's several in the Bay Area, so if you just look for, you know, technical writing recruiter, you'll find them. Um, there are also, the, the Bay Area has a chapter of the Society for Technical Communication. That's a great way um, to find out who's in the field and network with them. There are also outsourced writing companies that um, uh, that does just tech writing um, that you can find. There are several in the Bay Area as well. Um, so you have large companies hiring tech writers, and then you have technical writing companies hiring tech writers. So you've got a lot of opportunities there. But I would just do a, a Google search for them in your area because not everybody on this call is in the Bay Area. All right, next question. Is it part of the job to maintain the documents you have written so it's up to date? Yes. And it's oftentimes you need to go back and update a document somebody else has written, right? That's why it's important to have that style guide so everybody's using the same verbs and the same nouns when describing something. I'll give you an example of this. Um, uh, for my conference, we have LCD projectors that so people can see the screen. And I was out of town um, and went to buy one because it broke and Capital One declined the purchase because it was a large amount not in my state where I normally live in. So now I just tell them when I'm traveling so they you know, know it's a legitimate purchase. Well, if you go to their website, the option to do that is special, specify travel days. But if you go to their 800 number, the option, option is fraud management. First of all, I want to prevent my fraud, not manage it. But there are two people in the same company not even calling the same feature the same thing. That's why it's important to coordinate with other departments within a company. And this is where I sat in those core competencies, negotiation, coordination, interviewing skills. So much of tech writing is not writing. It's interviewing and planning and coordinating and project planning and stuff. Good questions. Next. To request get information inter interviews if possible. Abra, I don't understand that question. Would you re please rephrase it at the bottom and I'll get to it next. Do you see or hear more growth in tech writing business to business or business to consumer? I'd say they're both growing at the same pace. A lot of the business to business writing is marketing writing. And I'll tell you, I mentioned earlier that Technical writing is called different things in different departments, right? It's the same skill set to do marketing writing as it is to do technical writing. But the marketing, people tend to get all the funding because they generate revenue, where tech writers often are considered a cost center. So there are far more marketing writing jobs there are, than there are tech writing jobs. So given that there's more marketing being done, both business to consumer and business to business, I would say there's more growth in marketing than in tech com. Um, but they're both growing. Okay, next. What are some of the best actions? And I'm gonna see if I can make this chat window a little bit bigger. Okay. What are some of the actions I should take to convince companies to hire me? Do I need to have a portfolio of writing examples to get hired? 
Yes, as a short answer to that. Um, even if you take a technical writing class, you will help, they will give you assignments to do. Um, you can put those in your portfolio. Another thing you can do to make yourself more hireable is um, go to your favorite charity like Save the Bay, um, Habitat for Humanity, and offer to write the policies and procedures. Say, I'll work for coffee and donuts just to have something to put on my resume and something to put in my portfolio. And that way, you can say from October 2021 to present, independent contractor working for organizations such as, and list those organizations. Nowhere in your resume does it say how much you made at your last job. That's not in a resume, right? So you may have worked for pizza and Coke. I don't care, but I do want to see what you've done. So yeah, that's how you get um, samples to put in your portfolio. Okay, next. Are internships a common route for entering the industry? Or is it more viable to begin at an entry level full-time role? Summer internships are great, um, especially if you are, um, most companies these days want a tech writer to have a degree in something, right? That's why I say like, if you wanna study chemistry, get a degree in chemistry and take that technical writing class. That way you will have both the main knowledge and tech writing knowledge. Um, while you're going to school, summer internships are a great way to get your foot in the doors, yes. There's also entry level positions, but they're both good. STC.org may have recommendations for training. That is absolutely correct. As a contractor or new business, how do you recommend starting out getting your first clients? Beyond the domain specific training you recommended, is there anything else we should do when you don't have reviews or a body of work? If that were even something you could share? Yes. Yeah. First of all, um, oftentimes you will, your employer will ask you to sign a non disclosure. So you can't show a sample of your writing. So I always ask permission when I start a project said, hey, as an independent contractor, may I use this to, to land my next role? Um, if you're looking, if you want to start your own business um, or go independent contractor and you're currently working as a tech writer, um, oftentimes get that first technical writing job, right? So you can actually have a salary to eat on, you know, because eating is good. And then start developing your, your contract work on the side. And at some point, you're going to start turning away more business because you don't have time. That's when you quit your day job and do your tech writing company or independent contracting on, on the side because you'll be making more money there than you would. Where to find your clients? Network with people who need tech writing, right? So if you go to STC or other technical writing meetups, um, they'll be hiring managers. They're saying, yeah, I'm looking to hire. But if you go to say a C++, which is a programming language meetup, those programmers may need documentation for their software. So go to networking events where people will need your services. Um, I have been handing out my business card for years and I'll get somebody who called me and said, listen, um, I met you six years ago at such and such conference. I finally need a contract technical writing. I'm calling you in. All right, so that's one of the ways you market your services. But we could do a whole session on that topic alone. So Angela, if you want to uh, do an advanced, how do, uh, how, do you, how do you land your first technical writing client as an independent contractor? We could do that too. Okay, next, ditto training. Thank you, um, Angela, for putting that in the chat window. By the way, if you don't know this, in the bottom right-hand corner of the chat window is that dot, dot, dot menu. You can click on that and save the chat window. That way you can go back and get all these links that um, Angela has been dropping in. Roughly what percentage of technical writing work do you think is done in Apple's Pages software? I would say probably 1%. That would be my guess. Very few, very few done in Zoom Pages. Um, what's the career path for technical writers? Do they rise up or senior, uh, to senior tech writer, tech writing manager, director or something? How do they move forward? Okay. This is both good news and bad news. Yes, you start as an entry level, then you become a tech writer, tech writer two, then senior technical writer. Eventually you can become documentation manager. Normally though, that's where it stops. Where an engineer can become say, a software engineer, senior software engineer, um, developer manager. They could go on to be like vice president of development. They could go on to be CEO because they've risen up the ranks. That's not so much with tech writing. So if you want to, if you were looking for a career path 
where you want to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, TechBrewery is probably not the way to do that. But that's that's where usually where it stops is documentation management. Okay, 18 more. Oh God. All right, I'm gonna get through these at, um, as fast as I can. Angela, how much time do we have left? We have six minutes. Six minutes, holy moly. <laughs> okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to save this chat window and any questions that I don't get to live, I'll try to put them in an email, Angela, to you. And then you can send that out with the slides when the slides go out, okay? Sure, sounds good. All right. For a newbie to all of this, what is your insight on the practical route to get into this career without feeling overwhelmed in terms of time and money investment? A, take a certificate, uh, one class in tech writing, one to see if you like it, because um, that's enough to get you your first entry level job. Um, if you don't have domain knowledge, then take a second class in something you want to write about, such as network administration, um, uh, microbiology, uh, medical devices, uh, manufacturing, right? That way you have both the technical writing and the domain knowledge and those two classes or those two certificates probably would be a better word is how you get entry without being overwhelmed. Okay. Okay, so you answered that. Okay, good. Would you start as an employee or independent contractor right away? No, start as an employee. It's way too much to learn. Um, and uh, it would take you probably too long to get up to speed as an independent contractor. Um, oh, okay, good. Um, since I'm interested in starting a contract, okay, good, that's good. Given how popular Microsoft Word is, should we buy it ourselves to get proficient at it, or would getting used to one of the three alternatives like LibreOffice be sufficient? Um, yeah, you really should use Word. Um, even I mean, a good place like Google Docs is excellent, but it doesn't have all the functionality Word does. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to go out and spend, you know, four hundred dollars on Microsoft Word. Um, one, if you go on eBay, you can find a used copy. Just make sure you get the installation CD so it's not a bootleg copy. Um, and that's an easy way to learn Word is just get a used copy. Um, there's plenty of them out there. Um, yeah, that's my answer to that question. But there's, see, let me clarify that. I told you there are other authoring tools that tech writers use. And the way to find that is do a job search in your area and see what tools the people in your area are looking for. You can normally download free copies of all the tools for a 30 or 60 and 90 day trial. Or again, go on eBay, find used copies, but just make sure they're not bootleg. Yeah, nothing is worse than not getting a job because they have a tool and you don't have that tool especially since it's easy to learn these tools. Um, some of them like data are harder. Um, that's more database type programming stuff. But again, it's worth your while. Find what tools are being used in your area. Okay, so here's a nice topic to end on. When someone is looking to hire someone, they're looking for five things. One, what are you? Are you a tech writer? Are you a chef? What are you? Two, do you have experience in my industry? That's where that domain knowledge comes in. Three, do you have the tools we use here? For an entry-level position, they will probably train you on the tools, but if it's a two-month contract where they want you to come in, get done and get out, they want you to have those tools already. Um, four, how senior are you? Are you entry-level or management level? And five, can I afford you? And five is the only one not covered in your resume, right? So people want the domain knowledge, they want the tools, they wanna to know what you are and how senior you are. And then really, is this remote or are you near enough to come into the office? Okay, all right. Ah, um, when will we announce the book winners? Um, not live. Um, Angela, I believe, is going to send that out in the follow-up email. Is that correct, Angela? Yes, I will be sending out an email to the winners after the presentation ends. Excellent. Um, all right. Angela, do you have anything for me? Because that's a good place to end now. No, I, I think there was um, one question someone had asked way earlier. Um, they're asking about, do you do your own illustrations when you guys are writing the tech? when doing the technical writing? Yes and no. Um, a small company is probably gonna want you to do the illustrations like I did here. I drew this. Um, and I'm not, a, I, I don't have any formal training in art and I just figured out how to do it. Um, so chances are you'll be doing your own illustrations. You'll also be doing your own screen captures and oftentimes we have to cut them out. So there are tools 
that we use to do those screen captures with. And on the last page, um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. You never know um, when I get a job in, um, the first place I look at, people already know or are connected with, with that LinkedIn before posting the job online. So um, you're free to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you had a question you didn't want to ask in public, you're more than welcome to email me directly. And um, one of the ways I give back to the, the business is um, answering questions as people coming up through the ranks. I'd be happy to do that. Is technical writing a different kind of skill as an editor? Yes, completely different. Um, if you want to take a class in editing, but it's a different skill set for sure. Okay, good. All right, so I want to thank everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we tend not to fill entry level positions because companies usually can find those people on their own. So I'm not a good person to come to for an entry level position, um, but I can give advice and I can do resume reviews if you'd like some. Um, real quick, um, I'll, I could do a, a fast resume review for free, but if you want coaching, um, that's another option, but um, we're not gonna go into that today. Okay, good. So everyone, thank you very much. I hope you learned something today. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jack, for taking the time to share with us your knowledge of what it's like to work in the technical writing communication field. I would also like to thank everyone for attending. I hope you found this presentation informative. I'll be sending out a link to the recording along with the presentation slides and an evaluation survey. And I would really appreciate it if you could take the time out to fill out the survey so we can improve in our programs. With that, I'd like to end the program. Thank you all for joining. Have a good rest of your day. And Cheryl, yes, you may email me directly. And I will send out that evaluation survey with Jack's email as well. All right, all right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>